imagine all the people living for today. In Russland stößt der Angriffskrieg gegen die Ukraine auf wenig Protest in der Bevölkerung, auch weil für jede Art von zivilem Ungehorsam drakonische Strafen drohen. Nur noch wenige wagen trotzdem den Widerstand. Einer dieser Mutigen ist ein 84-jähriger Straßenkünstler, der in einer Kleinstadt außerhalb von Moskau Antikriegsgraffiti malt. Paul Krise hat mit ihm gesprochen. These bracelets are a symbol of Ukraine's resistance against Russia's invasion. They were made by the Azovstal steel plant in Mariupol, which became the backdrop for some of the most intense fighting since the invasion of Russian forces. Anton! Beginning. Anton, run away. A 30-meter pipe from an idle boiler house in the Kharkiv region will be used for production of potbelly stoves for military personnel. Russia must pay reparations to Ukraine. This is written in the resolution of the UN General Assembly. The document was supported by representatives of 94 countries. Eine positive Entwicklung hat es hingegen beim Thema Getreideausfuhrabkommen zwischen der Ukraine und Russland gegeben. Dear Ukrainians, I wish you health. The day of November 16th was long and hard, and in the evening it seemed that the events of the morning happened at least yesterday or the day before yesterday. In Russland stößt der Angriffskrieg gegen die Ukraine auf wenig Protest in der Bevölkerung, auch weil für jede Art von zivilem Ungehorsam drakonische Strafen drohen. Nur noch wenige wagen trotzdem den Widerstand. Einer dieser Mutigen ist ein 84-jähriger Straßenkünstler, der in einer Kleinstadt außerhalb von Moskau Antikriegsgraffiti malt. Paul Krise hat mit ihm gesprochen. Die Kleinstadt Borowsk, zwei Autostunden außerhalb von Moskau. Auf den ersten Blick ein grauer Provinzort, auf den zweiten ein Museum unter freiem Himmel. Rund 150 Wandgemälde schmücken die Fassaden. Ihren Schöpfer nennen manche den russischen Banksy. Sein echter Name, Wladimir Ovchinikov, 84 Jahre alt, Pensionist. Dieses Werk hätte ihn im Frühjahr fast die Freiheit gekostet. Ein ukrainisches Mädchen auf das Bomben fallen, darunter ein Aufruf zur Waffenruhe. Inzwischen ist das Bild übermalt. Sie brachten mich sofort zur Polizei. Ich musste eine Erklärung abgeben. Das Gericht verurteilte mich dann zu einer Geldstrafe wegen der Herabwürdigung der russischen Armee. Die rund 500 Euro Strafe kann der Pensionist nur dank Spenden zusammenkratzen. Im Ort ist Ovchinikov bei vielen beliebt. Bei den Behörden ist er es nicht. Um die Zensur zu umgehen, bringt er inzwischen vor allem Friedensbotschaften aus Sowjetzeiten auf die Wände. Er bewegt sich auf Messers Schneide, sagt Ovchinikov. Seine Friedensaufrufe auf den Wänden der Stadt werden meist vernichtet, doch seine künstlerische Mission geht weiter. These bracelets are a symbol of Ukraine's resistance against Russia's invasion. They were made by the Azovstal steel plant in Mariupol, which became the backdrop for some of the most intense fighting since the invasion of Russian forces. Ukrainian fighters and civilians had used the vast complex to shelter for nearly three months until their surrender in mid-May. They're now widely regarded as heroes in the country. Yuri Reisenkov is the director of Metinvest, which owns Azovstal. You are proud to be Ukrainian when you wear this bracelet. And uh, this is a very, very strong feeling. Uh, actually, all of my family already uh, bought one of those bracelets and, and they're They think it's something symbolic that unites the whole country. The material for the bracelets were taken from a sign that was once installed in central Kiev that read, Believe in the Armed Forces of Ukraine. They're decorated with a trident, a Ukrainian national symbol. This is the last batch, on sale for about $40 per bracelet. Its proceeds will go to an organization helping to finance the procurement and maintenance of drones used by the Ukrainian military. Yes. Anton! Beginning. Anton, run away. 
A 30-meter pipe from an idle boiler house in the Kharkiv region will be used for production of potbelly stoves for military personnel. Brothers Gennady Nemanikin and Yuri Ponomarenko decided that metal could be used in a new way. They started to receive the first orders for their furnaces in the spring. Then gas cylinders were used for its production. Potbelly stoves began to quickly gain popularity. This is the hope. You open it like that. Put it where it is needed. You see it blue. Close it. Open it. A local businessman helped the brothers to open the production of potbelly stoves. Everyone who was not indifferent donated money for materials. 150,000 hryvnias, it's 4,000 US dollars, were collected for the start. Hennady and Yuri opened a shop where six people work now. Previously they made six potbelly stoves a day. Now, due to problems with electricity, half as much. You know, I'll tell you honestly, the demand has fallen a little, apparently they have already begun to deliver a lot of them, but the fact is that we do it for free, we don't charge a penny from anyone, they offer discounts for the armed forces of Ukraine, but we do everything for free, for the armed forces of Ukraine. Yuri is a welder by profession. The brothers began to make the first potbelly stoves for the front back in 2014. For us, the most valuable thing is our victory, and the most valuable thing is that the solder should be warm there. If it is warm and the solder is dry, then everything will be fine, victory will be ours. Over the past three months, Kharkiv residents have made 76 stoves. Most of it was handed over to servicemen who participated in the liberation of the Kherson region. The rest for heating in the settlements of the deoccupied territories of the Kharkiv region. Now they are fulfilling orders from stormtroopers. They are making mini potbelly stoves and vertical stoves. The guys asked us to do it for a bunker. There is a very little space. Therefore, this horizontal one has nowhere to put it. But the vertical one is easy. The name of the project Give Warm to a Soldier came up with the wife of one of the brothers. Svetlana says when another potbelly stove is sent to the front line, they add sweets and preservation to the parcel from the residents of their village. As soon as we are about to go to the front line, we let people know we drive into the street already with potbelly stores and here are people from three or four yards running out into the street and carrying the parcels. When we arrive, I say we have nowhere to put. We have huge potbelly stores. There are ten of them. Here is our boss and we don't have enough space, but we stuff jars where we can. After sending such stoves, Ukrainian servicemen send feedback. Thank you for your portable pot belly stoves. We will take it to our brothers to the front line. They will keep warm. You increase our compatibility. Thank you. Now production is hampered by the fact that there is a regime of emergency power outage in the region. Therefore, volunteers organized a fundraiser for a generator in order to extend the working day of the craftsmen and increase the number of stoves made. Reported by Serhii Kulas, Natalia Bilokudria, UATV News. Russia must pay reparations to Ukraine. This is written in the resolution of the UN General Assembly. The document was supported by representatives of 94 countries. 73 states abstained from voting and 14 delegations voted against. Among them are Belarus, China, Russia, Syria, the Central African Republic, Cuba, North Korea, Iran, Mali, Zimbabwe, Eritrea and Nicaragua. At the UN platform, our diplomats worked for a long time with partners to agree on and adopt two very important resolutions. The first of them has been supported to create an international compensation mechanism that will make it possible to compensate for all losses caused by the Russian war and at the expense of Russian assets. The reparations that Russia will have to pay for what they have done are now part of the international legal reality. The UN resolution is of great political importance. This, in fact, is the foundation for creating a register of war damage and for working out mechanism for paying corporations to Ukraine. 
What does the UN resolution mean for us? The countries in which the arrested assets of Russia are located now have a legally justified decision and will be able to move from discussions to actions to start the work of the international compensation mechanism. Ukraine will offer them to conclude an international treaty to hold Russia accountable and compensate for the losses caused by Russia's aggression. Irina Mudra, Deputy Minister of Justice of Ukraine on Facebook. The West has already frozen Russian assets in the amount of 300 to 500 billion US dollars. This figure was announced in September by the Prime Minister of Ukraine, Denis Shmihal. According to experts, representatives of the international community will soon begin to develop a single mechanism and legally binding documents to hold the Russian Federation accountable and compensate for damages. An international agreement will be concluded on the basis of this resolution. It will provide for at least registration of damage caused to the state, Ukraine, as well as individuals, legal entities. It will be an international mechanism adopted in cooperation with Ukraine. I think that this will be a multilateral document a multilateral treaty that states will join. Accordingly, it will be obligatory for the states that join it. The Kremlin predictably disagrees with the UN resolution. Moscow said that Russia would do everything possible to prevent the seizure of its frozen assets. Naturally, the organizers of this process are trying to complete the robbery of our reserves, which were blocked in a completely illegal way. This is the formalization of this robbery using the United Nations. This decision is not legally binding, and that is how we will treat it. Dmitry Peskov, press secretary of the President of Russia. To date, according to preliminary estimates, the Russian Federation has caused damage to Ukraine by more than 300 billion US dollars. The Russian Federation has 140 million citizens. And by simple arithmetic, it turns out that every Russian, including infants, already owes Ukraine more than 2,000 US dollars. And with every day of the Russian war against Ukraine, this amount will increase. Reported by Roman Smoller, Vlada Turkan, UATV News. Eine positive Entwicklung hat es hingegen beim Thema Getreideausfuhrabkommen zwischen der Ukraine und Russland gegeben. Nach ukrainischen Angaben wird dieses um 120 Tage verlängert. Das teilte der ukrainische Infrastrukturminister am Donnerstag auf Twitter mit, ohne Details zu nennen. Das von der Türkei und den Vereinten Nationen vermittelte Abkommen soll es der Ukraine ermöglichen, trotz des Krieges Getreide aus ihren Schwarzmeerhäfen zu exportieren. Dear Ukrainians, I wish you health. The day of November 16th was long and hard, and in the evening it seemed that the events of the morning happened at least yesterday or the day before yesterday. The summit in Indonesia. I took part in the work of the leaders. Then another meeting of the staff of the Supreme Commander-in-Chief. Discussion in detail. The situation at the front. Also, the military presented all the available data on the missile hitting the territory of Poland. Everyone responsible for liquidating the consequences of Russian missile strikes on Ukraine reported on the recovery work. Recovery does not stop for a minute. Emergency blackouts and stabilization outages continue in 18 regions and in the city of Kyiv. These are millions of consumers. We are doing everything to restore electricity, both generation and supply. Another meeting of the Ramstein Defense Group took place. The key issue is the strengthening of our anti-aircraft and anti-missile defense. I held negotiations with the Vice President of the World Bank, who is responsible for our region. We discussed projects for the reconstruction of our infrastructure and social facilities, the work of the recovery fund of our country. The total cost of projects discussed is billions of dollars. This is something that needs to be rebuilt now to guarantee a normal life for our people. There were reports on the liberation of the territories of the Kherson region. We are doing everything to provide people with electricity, water, communications, financial and social services, and normal medicine as soon as possible. Pharmacies are finally reopening in Kherson, the post office, banks are working. People are getting access to the Internet. There are already 30 humanitarian aid distribution points. 
Electricity was restored to more than 20 day-occupied settlements in Kherson region. Mykolaiv region is the same. We return everything necessary for a normal life. We are working to restore the water supply to Mykolaiv. Payment of pensions has started in Snihurivka, and I thank everyone who provides recovery. And especially our sappers and rescuers, thanks to their work, everyone else can work safely. Once again, I will repeat to everyone in the de-occupied territory, please be very careful. Russia wants to kill even after fleeing from our land, therefore you need to be very careful. If you see anything suspicious, report it to the emergency services and the police. If a building has not yet been checked by sappers, please do not enter. If the road has been not checked yet, please skip it. Reports and messages from Donetsk region are unchanged. Fierce battles continue at the same points as before. We hold our positions despite dozens of attacks. Of course, there was a lot of international communication. Not everything can be talked about now. We protect the interests of Ukraine as always. November 16th is the professional day of thousands of our people who perform one of the most important jobs. And this is not only the work to inform people. The day of radio, television and communication workers is about those who strengthen democracy at all times, who integrate society informationally, emotionally and politically, who unites our interests, our pain and our joys, our hopes and aspirations, our problems. The stronger this fear is in the country, the stronger the democracy is there. I sincerely congratulate everyone who works in this field each one. Those who make a telethon and those who work on other information platforms, presenters, reporters whom we see and hear, studio workers, producers, editorial staff whom society usually does not see and hear, but without whom this industry simply would not exist. Thank you all for your work for Ukrainians. On November 16th there was a rather long interview. I also held an off-the-record meeting for journalists specifically for radio and television workers. There was also a meeting of the UN Security Council regarding the new wave of Russian missile terror. We are monitoring statements, working with partners and defending Ukrainian interests. Of course, one of the main issues at the Security Council meeting is the situation in Poland, the clarification of all the circumstances of how Russian aggression crossed the Polish border. The Ukrainian position is very transparent. We strive to stabilize all the detail, every fact. This is why we need our specialists to join the work of the international investigation and to get access to all the data available to our partners and the site of the explosion. All our information is in full access. We have been giving it to our partners since the night, from those first hours when the world began to find out what happened. I spoke with President Duda and expressed my condolences to him. Russian aggression took the lives of two Polish citizens. And I want all of us to honor the memory of all those whose lives were taken by this Russian war with a minute of silence. Citizens of Ukraine, citizens of Poland. Nothing to kill or die for And no religion too Imagine all the people